are being sold a bunch of BS about how we should look and feel about ourselves. Now that's some fake news, you don't hear about that often. My guest today is a celebrity who is calling out everyone who profits from selling lies about beauty, from Hollywood to advertising. You could call her a whistleblower. I've never really had a desire to be famous. The only desire of it for me was to be able to have a platform to make change. Jamila Jamil, who starts on the hit NBC show The Good Place, is taking on everyone in the industry, from Kim Kardashian to Avon. And she started a campaign on Instagram, iWay, encouraging women to celebrate the aspects of their lives beyond numbers on a scale. Today, we see beauty myths and Hollywood through Jamila Jamil's eyes. Oh. <laughs> Are you tired? You need more Come stuff. on! <laughs> How are you? Don't you exercise? No, Come I don't on. exercise. You don't exercise? No, I was told by a doctor that I'm clinically weak. Seriously? Yeah. Yoga? Seriously. Or something? No, nothing. 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 Have a seat. Yes, you are here. You just hit one million followers. Congratulations Thank you on very Instagram. Much. And you're choosing to use that for good purposes in here. You know, you're taking on the big guys in here. You took on Avon to change their campaign because they shamed women for having cellulite. Thank you very much. As a woman who does have cellulite, yeah, I really so do appreciate I. it. Yeah. You know, what was sort of what at what point in your life where you just said, This is enough, I'm done, I'm gonna speak up. Sadly, it took me being fat shamed nationally like six years ago um, when I had reached this incredible pinnacle of my career. I would made history as the first ever woman to host the BBC official chart solo, which is a huge show on a huge station, arguably one of the biggest stations in the world. And the newspapers wouldn't report what I'd uh, succeeded at in my work. They just reported that I'd gained three dress sizes. And after seeing my photograph of my, uh, photographs of my bottom and me bending over and me midair, just like all shaming me, pictures from underneath, trying to get pictures of my buttocks, um, always placed next to very, very skinny photographs of me from before, made me realize that there's really something wrong. And I wish it hadn't taken me being in the line of fire for me to realize I had to do something. But that was when I began my activism. And the reason that some people haven't heard about it over here until now is that I think because I was curvaceous at the time, nobody listened to me. And the saddest part of that is that I've now lost weight because I'm no longer on the medication that made me gain weight before. And now people are listening to me. And that is kind of part of the problem that people mm. don't listen to people who are of the minority. They just listen to the privileged, which is why as a privileged person, I don't believe that it's not my place to say something. Those who criticize you, they say, well, she's good looking. Mm. And who is she to talk about that? You're just saying, I've actually been on all sides of the spectrum in terms of my body weight and my body images and all of that. And I'm speaking out of experience. I'm speaking from experience, but I'm also speaking from a privilege of being slender and being on an NBC sitcom. And so I do have privilege and I have experience. And if we don't let people who are marginalized speak out, we don't give them a platform, we call them jealous and bitter. And then we tell the people who are societally attractive that they're not allowed to talk about it, then who gets to talk about it? How does the discussion ever get had? It's a Fair. clever way to silence everyone. Jamil waged a social media war in May last year when Kim Kardashian posted this Instagram photo promoting appetite suppressant lollipops. Jamil responded with a skating tweet, calling her a quote, terrible and toxic influence on young girls. The next day, Kardashian deleted her tweet. You've been like fearless in taking on the issue and you're not shy about naming anybody. I mean, no. you took on the Kardashian and called them double agents for the patriarchy. Tell me more about that. A double agent for the patriarchy is someone who perhaps unknowingly is selling a rhetoric that the patriarchy benefits from us believing in. And so if you tell women that they should worry about their weight and their looks all the time, you are unfortunately recycling that patriarch patriarchal narrative that made you feel that about yourselves. We are world leaders, we are designers, we are scientists, we are mothers, we are friends, we are huge contributors to society. We are supposed to be treated like an equal gender, but how can we become equal if we are given all this extra homework of being uh, very, very thin and completely flawless in every single way and looking forever young, even though time is coming to us all, gravity is coming to us all. It's 
massively okay for men. We shoot men on the front cover of magazines uh, in high definition. You can see all of their wrinkles and it's seen as dignified and sexy. But we airbrush women to the point where they look like newborns. Women in their 50s look like teenagers on the cover of magazines. It's true. What's the messaging out there? It's just, it's men are told to be successful enough to marry the supermodel. We are told just to be the supermodel. It's not only Kardashians, it's actually, could you argue that, you know, it's Vogue magazine who's like, put that image out and sell that image out in the red carpets and in the front pages. So it's not only- Yeah, I haven't blamed the Kardashians. The fact that you've said the word Kardashian in this interview, the Kardashians will now become the main press pickup of this interview in spite of all the things I say, because it's such a convenient way to stop anyone from looking at them. They just say, they point at the Kardashians, they point at me, they point at other women. They don't say, actually, we fat shamed the Kardashians into becoming. They explicitly and blatantly, not even in a subliminal way, fat shame the Kardashians into now being obsessed with their aesthetic. Of course they are now obsessed with their looks. The pressures are so ridiculous from our society and the magazines have a massive part to play in it. The media have a huge part to play in it and advertising. The fact that they have to shame people into buying their products says that it illustrates that they are selling a dud product. You're a beautiful woman. Did you always think that you're beautiful? No. Really? I still don't think I'm beautiful. I like wearing a little bit of makeup or sometimes a lot of makeup um, to have fun with it. But I don't think I can, I have uh, body dysmorphia. So it's very difficult for me to see in the mirror what other people can see when they look at me. And that's something I developed as a teenager. I think from being overexposed to images that were airbrushed and thinned out and never seeing uh, variations of people uh, anywhere. And so I started to, I don't know if that's the exact cause, but I know that that definitely contributed to it. I started to look at my body as just this big evil flaw and not think about how grateful I am for how it works and the fact that it takes me from A to B and that I'm able to live because of this body. I just looked at it as a source of pain and failure. Until today? Until until probably a year ago. Really? Yeah. And, and what starting changed? my movement, the I weigh movement on Instagram and, and making that statement and then watching thousands and hundreds and thousands of people make that statement back to me that we are more than what we are on the outside. It just reinforced it to me. I started this hoping that I would help other people. I had no idea how much they would help me. What's the biggest message from the Ai Wei movement? The biggest message from the Ai Wei movement is to remember that you are a multifaceted and important individual and that society's manipulation of you just to make you feel bad about yourself so that you'll go out and buy products that you don't actually need is not a reflection of what you actually are in this world. And you must think about everything you're going to remember on your deathbed and know that it won't be your abs. And so focus on all those things you're gonna build so that you have something great to look back on one day. So can you say your misfortunes have led to your fortune? You're outspoken, you are a celebrity, you're beautiful. I mean, you're celebrating life as well. Thanks. I'm right? also f***ing tired, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I've, been, I've, been very, uh, I've been very lucky in how things have panned out, but I also worked very hard for that to happen. That's true. And I am very, very diligent in making sure that I am a responsible role model. And I, I hope that there will be more people who look and see the, the attention or respect that I've been lucky to receive in the last year and feel inspired by that. And they too stop photoshopping their photographs and allowing digitally enhanced images and selling toxic narratives or toxic products to kids. I hope they realize that there's something good about being a good role model and it's not cool to not care. The question for me is what's the balance between women and beauty? Because we do mm -hmm. like to feel beautiful. It is, yeah. beauty is important in our lives. Yeah, you know? it should just and be so part of your top 10. It shouldn't like cover your whole top 10. Okay. That's it. As long as your top 10 priorities aren't centered around your aesthetic, then I think you're fine. It's allowed to be one-tenth, just like it is for Mark Ronson or Bruno Mars or any uh, or Leonardo DiCaprio. That is one part of who he is. One part of his day is thinking about that and making sure that he looks nice. That's it. How do you feel about plastic surgeries? Plastic surgery is your choice as long as you're open with it. If you're open about it and you tell people, I think Chrissy Teigen's amazing when it comes to that, the fact that she's so open about whatever work she's had done. I admire anyone who is uh, honest about it and transparent. I haven't had any plastic surgery on my face, but I've had my breasts reduced. I had a lump removed and after that, one was a different size to the other. I had them both made smaller. My life is better, my back hurts less. Great, I tell people about it. So that's the ultimate message, is yeah, that be transparent about who you just are. Know some, just right. let people know that they don't have to live up to you because you didn't even live up to you. Don't airbrush your pictures, don't get surgery without admitting to it and don't set other people up for failure because it's ridiculous.
I want to actually also present women who are now on Instagram posing in a, a in a objectified way mm -hmm. on some. And then yet when I interviewed some of them, they said, this is part of our power. We are taking the power of our body and we're posing the way we want to do it. That's the split right now within feminism, you know, between those who are just saying, this is my, this is my freedom. And, and those, those who are saying you're being objectified. Where do you fit in that? I think that if you want to show off your body, that's fine, but make sure that you include lesbians within your sexuality or make sure that you're showing men make an effort for you. I think there is a lot of the narrative that women do all the work and women wear all the sexy clothes and women do all the moves, all the heavy lifting and sex and men just sit there wearing outdoor winter layers sitting on a chair. And I don't think that's good for boys to see or girls to see because then boys think they don't have to make an effort and girls think that men don't have to make an effort as well. You know, we've got to think that there are some very young people taking in this material and we kind of have to teach them. I think Madonna used to show sexuality in a very empowering way that had everyone, everyone was shagging everyone. And you had men going down on women and men going down on men. And you had every, it felt, sex felt like a party. And I think sometimes it feels like a one woman show. And it's completely your right to do whatever you want to do with your body. But I think it would be really cool to see us maybe make sex more of an inclusive activity rather than something where just women do all of the work. Let's talk about Me Too. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any role for redemption? I think that we need to stop giving really big, well-paid, highly publicized roles to people who have hurt women, at least for a while. Let's just take a little break from celebrating people who hurt women. Uh, I think otherwise the messaging, uh, if you allow people back, uh, unless they have maybe donated half of their income to Rain or uh, some sort of charity for women, unless they're actively doing something to fully uh, help restore women's well-being uh, and people who have been victims of sexual or domestic assault or violence. Um, but I think we should just chill out for a while and give the roles and give the money to people who don't hurt women. I think that'd be a great message for boys and for girls to see that we're taking this seriously. And I would like to hope that we don't allow racists and bigots to have big parts in Hollywood movies. So therefore, if you've assaulted a woman, you should just f off for a while. Do you see any institutional change in Hollywood? I have felt a big change in Hollywood. Such as? Oh, I'm not being uh, cuddled at the end of meetings anymore, long hugs. Did you face something uh, like that? Yeah, no, it's just like, yeah. there's always like the little squeeze at the end and the, the, always the, the cuddle and then the ask for the follow-up meeting to be at 9 p.m. Uh, over a dinner rather than just in an office during uh, office hours uh, during the day. Within this industry, I've been quite lucky and I think part of that is how outspoken I am. I think people are scared that I will immediately tweet that I've been treated inappropriately. <laughs> What's the biggest message people need to learn about consent? Talk about it. It's so weird to not be able to talk about something that we are going to do. It's not, it's a, it's a completely natural, wonderful, fun thing that should be not, that should not be embarrassing to talk about. And parents shouldn't be, you are doing a disservice to your children if you make it a taboo thing to talk about and you make it something they feel ashamed of or embarrassed about. And schools are doing a disservice by only teaching people about fallopian tubes rather than consent. Because they're not learning it from Pornhub and unfortunately, that's where they're learning a lot of things about sex from and from other porn channels and from media. And there's no real discussion or education about it. I used to really judge the BDSM community when I was, because I was ignorant about it. And I just thought that they were really kinky and a bit weird. And then after doing the documentary about consent and interviewing so many people from within that community, I realized that the, the foundation of BDSM is consent and everyone checks with everyone what it is that they're gonna wanna do and they yeah. have safe words and everyone's got their limits and everyone knows each other's limits and it's not made weird to talk about. So actually the BDSM community are light years ahead of us and fewer people get hurt than they do outside of that. So let's just turn the lights on That's and talk about really it. That's really interesting actually. That's really interesting. Widen the discussion and yeah. make it open. Knowledge so is power. It was a very, very racist time in England. And I was very badly racially, physically abused for being... Physically? Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, this right here is, is the door to um, the good place. Jamila Jamil plays the role of a snobby socialite and philanthropist named Tahani Al Jamil on NBC's The Good Place. Wonderful. Alongside Ted Danson and Kristen Bell. They all land in heaven, or the good place, where there is unlimited frozen yogurt and no cursing allowed. Holy mother forking shirt balls.
Now let's go to the good place, mm -hmm. heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe in heaven and hell? I don't believe in heaven and hell. What personally. do you believe in? I don't really think too much about anything that isn't that is outside of what I can see in front of me, if I'm being perfectly honest. So I'm not a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person. Um, and yet I hope karma exists. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so no, I, I don't, I don't. But, but having said that, there is a tiny suspicion in my mind now because of the show that it, there might be something after here. Is there any religion you grew up with? No. Jamila Jamil was born and raised in the United Kingdom. Her parents, an Indian father and Pakistani mother, divorced when Jamil was a child. She had full scholarship to a private all-girls school where she says she was bullied relentlessly. I have to say, I'm so curious because they're Pakistani and, 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 and Indian, mm -hmm. are they enemies? No, I mean, not in my household. <laughs> okay, good. No, no, we just weren't really, we weren't brought up with much of our culture at all, really. We were just sort of, we were brought up in England. It was a very, very racist time in England uh, towards my culture where there were a lot of hate crimes and there still are a lot of hate crimes against us. And I was very badly racially, physically abused for being- Physically? Yeah, for being, you know, a packy, as they said at school. And I was one of the only of my kind in any school that I went to. And I came from a poor background and my parents were not together so you know it was just a very difficult time so I think my parents kind of made the decision very early on to just sort of let us integrate with the culture that we were existing in in which we were the minority and and I have had my adult life to now learn about my culture and that's been fine. When you were young what did you want to be when you were older? Oh I'm so South Asian I wanted to be a doctor. Of course or that's an engineer. What we want to be. <laughs> Right. I really wanted to be a doctor and I love biology and I still love the human body and I love understanding, uh, I love medicine, but I I got hit by a car. I was on course to be a doctor uh, and I was hit by a car when I was 17, barely out of six, like just about to turn 17 and hurt my back very badly and my sacroiliac joint has never really recovered. Um, and so I was in bed for over a year, just watching television on my own, couldn't finish my scholarship and I was offered my, because I had a full academic scholarship and they were really cool and they offered for me to finish it after being in bed for so long, but I'd missed almost two years of school and the idea of going and sitting in a classroom with people much younger than me, just after that long in bed, I wanted to get out and work and see the world. So it just sort of derailed me um, from that career, but now it's put me where I am. When you got your first job, you know, it was a coincidence as I, as I heard it. You just applied because it was a better paying oh, job. I, I, uh, a man met me in a pub. He told me he thought I was funny. He told me about this job to replace Alexa Chung, this like model host who was uh, on this huge show in England. And I said, no, because I didn't want to be on television. And he said it was a thousand pounds a day. And I immediately took the email address and immediately sent an email that night. What was uh, your salary then? It was something like 150 pounds a week. So it was like quite a big jump. Of and you course. do a lot of hours as yeah. a teacher. Uh, and uh, that's what I was doing. I was an English teacher at the time. And so I took the job. I got the job. I took it. And my life changed. You miss teaching? Yes. Really? Yeah. But I'm kind of just lecturing people now. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true. You're I'm still, still teaching. teaching people exactly. In a way. Tell us about your love life. How's it going? I'm just in a relationship with a very nice man. And I love him. And he's a good feminist. So a lot of your critics in England, they come mostly in England. Has any of the criticism been constructive? That Always, example? I find so much criticism. Like when I was told that my, my, my feminism wasn't intersectional enough and that I wasn't doing enough to serve black women. And I realized that, oh, all this time I thought because I'm a woman of color and they are women of color, our experience is the same. And because I've been racially abused and they've been racially abused, we are all as one. And therefore I wasn't doing enough to publicly make sure that I was looking out for women who are so marginalized. And also I wasn't from America. I didn't realize it's even worse here than anywhere else. And so that made me just wake up and realize that, okay, you know what? It's not enough just not to be a bad person. I have to actively promote the voices of those who are doing all of the work out there and the people who are being made invisible by our culture. I have to bring them and use, share my limelight that I'm so lucky to have. And so, I think that while A, we need to become better at taking criticism and realizing that it's okay to be criticized as long as you learn. B, I do think we could be slightly softer on those who want to help, but just maybe not going about it in the right way and not 
like sort of ban them forever That's true. because it's we're going to lose allies. we're going to lose allies yes it's a real trend now because someone said the wrong thing or the wrong way or was affiliated with something accidentally that they didn't understand so you know for example i think people think that i hate the women that i criticize or i hate the brands that i criticize i don't as soon as they stop selling laxatives to kids they're back on my good side unless they say something transphobic in which case then they need to also address that you said you're a feminist in progress mm -hmm. what does that mean a feminist in progress is something that I believe we all are, male or female. Everyone has a blind spot, everyone has a weakness, everyone has an ignorance. And as long as you are actively working to resolve those and become a better person and a more informed and tolerant and intersectional person, then I think you're on the right track and you're allowed to be called a feminist in progress. I'm not pretending to be perfect. I have a lot to learn, but I will never stop trying to learn as much as I can. I mean, I'm currently being called out right now because I'm in this wonderful, wonderful, empowering, incredible campaign with Airy, and uh, people are saying that there aren't enough plus size people in the campaign photo because there's a group shot of lots of people. You have sexual assault survivors, you have a woman who has a disability, you have a blind woman, you have a dark skinned black woman, a lesbian, you have a South Asian woman, you have activists uh, and there's no editing and no retouching. But there isn't, uh, and you have Iskra Lawrence, who is a curvy lingerie model, but she's not plus size enough um, for people to feel included. And I'm currently getting criticism for that. But rather than sit there and play the victim and just be like, poor me, I'm, I'm addressing it. I'm taking it on and going, you know what? Yeah, we need more fat women in all branding and advertising. And I'm glad you said something to me and I will do what I can. I immediately sat down with the bosses of Aerie and discussed how, you know, what we can do about this. I want to take action and I want to address people's concerns. So I personally love criticism. I do think we have a problem with woke bashing What's and woke bashing? woke bashing is like mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the wokest of them all. Uh -huh. And we now, if someone makes one single misstep or says one wrong word or said the wrong thing 12 years ago before we all became more educated, then they are canceled forever. We have cancel culture. That's true. And I think that that is a toxic and unhelpful way to go forward if we want allies, because we scare people out of becoming allies because they're scared that they might have a skeleton in their closet or they might not know all the answers. So people don't put their hand up because we've made them so afraid of being ignorant. Hey guys, together, Jamil prefers to keep her own love life out of the spotlight. Her boyfriend of over three years is singer-songwriter James Blake. Aside from the occasional affectionate posts about each other on social media, Jamil prefers not to talk about her relationship. Tell us about your love life. How is it going? I'm just in a relationship with a very nice man and I love him and he's a good feminist. Well, what does that mean? It means to be a good feminist in a relationship with him. He's an ally woman. and he is very dedicated to uh, the equal rights of women and he's very good at supporting me when I uh, falter, when it comes to believing in myself and pushing for me to ask for more when I deserve more. And he's just sort of... He's taught me white male privilege <laughs> as in how to have it as a brown woman and how to like expect the same that he would expect for himself. He believes like in, an insider tip, basically. Yeah, an insider tip yeah. and also just like boosting me in a way that I've never had anyone boost me before. I've never had a champion like this. And so that's been really cool. And uh, and he's very invested in learning and he's reading Roxanne Gay right now, which I think is great. And so, yeah, that's it. I don't talk about him too much, but uh, All right. he's a good egg. Do you think in 10 years the definition of beauty will be changed uh, in America or in, around the world? I do think so. And you I think see it that. will change faster than ever before because of social media. As we saw with Me Too and Time's Up, the power of social media can be so damaging, but it can also be so extraordinary and it can create real change. And so I do think change is coming. We're already seeing different looking icons than all the very important women who are now on the front covers of magazines you would never have seen on the covers, covers of magazines before. Even me, I'm the first South Asian I've seen on so many covers. And then Priyanka Chopra on the cover of American Vogue in December. It was such a win. Mindy Kaling, cover of Elle. Like, I think things are changing. And I think in 10 years, the world will be unrecognizable and we will laugh at how we used to be. What's inside Jamila that keeps her going? I think what's inside of me is the is trying to turn all of the pain that I've experienced in my life into something good so that it didn't happen for nothing. So that all the different ways in which I've been traumatized in my life and all the different ways in which I've, all the different things I've had to go through didn't happen to me for nothing, that I could stop someone else from feeling that way. And then I recycled it and turned it into something good. Were you always like that or you learned to be like that? No, I think I've always been a fairly empathetic person. Uh, and I think that's just... I think part of why, you know, I've never really had a desire to be famous or an actress or a model. This all kind of fell into my lap. 
truly. And the only real desire of it for me was to be able to have a platform to make change. And I said that from when I, my very first day, the first time I ever met my agent when I was 22, is that if I'm gonna do this, I'd like to use, use that platform to, to help people. And so I'm gonna do that forever. Jamila, thank Thanks. you so much. Really a pleasure. Thank you.